Hello guys, how are you all, welcome back to my channel, so, today we are gonna see, what if Naruto awakened unknown bloodline and becomes white, part 1, subscribe if you enjoy the video, and also check the description, so let's begin the story. Naruto stumbled into the crappy hotel building that he lived in. He was tired and full. He had just come back from Raymond with Iruka, celebrating Naruto's victory over Mizuki. Iruka was still injured, but it insisted on eating Raymond with Naruto. The hospital staff wasn't happy about it, especially since he was going out with the demon brat, but they eventually caved. Now though Naruto was starting to regret eating so much ramen, a first for the blonde ninja. His stomach felt like it was going to explode, and it was burning like hell, too. He made it up the stairs and fumbled with his keys, ignoring the profanities written all over the door, he turned the knob and walked in. He was able to make it to the bed but not much further. He barely tugged off his orange jumpsuit before he climbed into bed. Naruto pulled up the covers and shivered under his blanket. Why am I so cold he thought, making sure that he was completely covered by the blanket. He finally gave up and just tried to get to sleep. It took several hours of shivering before Naruto was able to fall asleep, the gnawing pain of his stomach was the last thing that he felt as he drifted into unconsciousness. Hayubi growled. Something was happening to the boy. The sower that had once held the nine tails, had turned a pale white, and seemed to be more solid than before. The fox snarled and swiped at the cages. The prison rattled but didn't budge. Suddenly a wall of white came crashing down, covering the whole front of the Kyubi's cage. The fox's eyes widened, he had seen this before, but this was much more advanced. This was self-defensive, the nine tails grinned. This could be to his advantage. Naruto woke up in the morning with the biggest headache of his life. He groaned and held his forehead with one hand as he stood up. He barely registered that his stomach wasn't hurting anymore. The blonde pulled his jumpsuit on and stepped into his small living room. He sat down on a chair and slowly started to gain his bearings. He blinked when he remembered the fight with Mizuki. He hadn't had any time to think about it last night, he had been too happy about finally becoming a genin. But now, he tentatively rested a hand on his navel. Could there really be a demon inside of him? He frowned at that thought. It would make sense. The way the villagers treated him, the way everyone always either avoided him or did anything in their power to hurt him. He sighed and stood up. He needed some Raymond. Naruto pulled out a package from the cupboard and set on some water to boil before returning to his seat. The blonde sunk back into depression as his thoughts drifted back to Aruka. It's my fault he's hurt. If I had only killed that nonsense Mizuki before he had a chance to hurt him he would have gripped the chair. It was his fault. He could have used Cage Bunshin at the very beginning of the fight, but he had frozen. The killer intent the Chunin teacher had used had glued him to the spot and almost cost Aruka a life. Just a few more inches either way, the doctors had said, and it would have pierced a vital organ, and there would be nothing we could do. It's my fault Naruto frowned, he knew that he had been completely drained of chakra by the time Mizuki had shown up, and he couldn't have used cage bunshin. He was just fooling himself. Then why could I do it later? The whole time he had been practicing the cage bunshin no jutsu, he had never been able to make more than 30 clones. But after Aruka had gotten hit by the shuriken, he had been able to make a thousand, after he had already been drained of chakra. How? This had the boy stumped until he happened to glance down at his belly. He put a hand on it again. Could the demon have given him power? Now that he thought about it, he had felt different when he had used Cage Bunshin against Mizuki. He had felt well, powerful. He scowled, why would the demon give him power? Unless had he drawn it out himself. The whistling of the tea kettle brought him out of his thoughts. The blonde walked back into the kitchen and poured the water into his ramen bowl. He cursed as he tried to take a bite and burned his tongue. He set the bowl on the counter as he went into the bathroom to take a shower as it cooled. He walked into the bathroom and slipped off his orange jumpsuit once again, setting it on the toilet as he prepared to turn the water on. As he reached into the shower however, he managed to catch a glimpse of himself in the mirror stationed above his bathtub. Back he let out as he touched his forehead. There were two red dots on his forehead. Naruto frantically got the soap bar out of the shower and tried futilely to scrub the red things off. What the hell? The blonde squinted at the mirror. The dots were placed right above his eyebrows, perfectly symmetrical and a fiery red. He reached up and pinched the dot that was resting above his right eyebrow. Ouch he yelped his pain shot through his head. He now knew what was causing his headache. He scowled at his reflection for a few more moments before he made a decision. He jumped into the shower and turned the water on, nearly hitting the roof as a cold blast hit him. Naruto almost leaped out of the bathtub until he remembered that the water had to heat up before he got in. He felt like smacking himself, how did he forget that? He let out a sigh of relief as the water warmed up to a comfortable temperature. He quickly grabbed the shampoo and started to rub it in his hair. He had to take quick showers, if he used too much water the landlord would cut him off. As Naruto ran his hands through his hair, he felt something off. His hair felt different, a little less thick than it usually was, and less knotted than his usual, unruly blonde locks were. 
he passed it off as his imagination and started to rub the spots above his eyebrows. But as he looked back at the mirror he groaned when he saw that all he had accomplished was to irritate the skin around the dots making two big red sores on his forehead. Naruto shut the water off and tried himself with a towel. Making sure that he was totally dry, he put on his jumpsuit and walked back into the kitchen where his cold Raymond sat on the counter. All of his fussing in the bathroom must have taken longer than he thought. He glanced at the clock and his eyes widened. 9 o'clock. Quickly he stuffed as much Raymond into his mouth as he could before he ran to the window. He almost leaped out when he remembered his headband. Racing into his room, he swiped the hit I ate off the nightstand and tied it on, making sure it covered all of his forehead, including the mysterious red dots. Pecking himself over in the mirror once, he ran to the window and leaped out onto the neighboring building. He quickly leaped off of this one also, landing on the next. As he continued jumping from rooftop to rooftop he noticed something. He could barely feel any pressure on his legs when he hit the next building. It was like he was just hopping up and down instead of leaping 10 feet into the air. He was so preoccupied with this discovery that he nearly ran into the academy before he noticed it. He grinned, jumping off the rooftop. He ran through the open doorway and down the hall until he got to Aruka's classroom. Naruto hoped he hadn't missed hearing the team arrangements. He gripped the knob and swung the door open, just as Aruka was starting to announce the first team. The Chuanin stopped mid-sentence when Naruto walked in and shot him a dirty look. Naruto gave him a grin and walked up to his seat. He was mildly surprised to see Aruka here, he didn't think those old harpies would ever let him leave the hospital. He sat down and tried to listen as Aruka announced the teams. As hard as he tried, Naruto couldn't keep his mind off of the two crimson dots that now decorated his brow. He had no idea where they came from, and he had no idea how he was going to get rid of them. He could hang over them, but any could see through his weak dot. He scowled. He would have to ask Saratobi about it. Naruto rubbed his forearm. It had started to feel sore on the way to the academy and was starting to become an annoyance. The blonde was starting to worry about all the pains he had been getting lately. He had a headache and had found out he had dots on his forehead, did that mean that he would grow little round crimson dots on his arms? He very quickly shoved that particular thought away. Shuddering, he just barely caught the mention of Sakura's name. Like the admirer that he was, the blonde quickly glanced up at Aruka, willing him to call his name. Aruka cleared his throat before he called the next name. Yuzumaki Naruto, yes. He almost jumped up and down. He was with Sakura. He would finally get her to go out to dinner with him. The boy's ecstatic moment didn't last long however, as Aruka called the second name. Ichiha Sasuke, Naruto's grin instantly disappeared from his face. Why did that team have to be on Sakura and his team? He sighed. If that stupid Ichiha wasn't on the team he would what? The blonde admitted that he didn't know what he would do. Sakura had to like him didn't she? Then again, she never had accepted any of his offers. She had never been overly nice to him. Come to think of it, she had never even said hello to him unless prompted to do so by himself. The more he thought of it, the more he realized that he had never had a chance with Sakura anyway, she wouldn't give him the time of day. Naruto half grinned, he had been thinking about things a lot. Then again, the incident with Mizuki had taught him that he should think things over beforehand. He had just waltzed into the Hokage office and stole a scroll that had been locked in the back, not even thinking about what his teacher had told him. He should have known that they wouldn't have another test for those that failed. If they did, it certainly wouldn't involve breaking into the Hokage office. It was now drilled into his head that he would think things through from now on. That meant that he wouldn't pursue hopeless things anymore, like Sakura. Or being Hokage this thought was shoved away. Of course he could be Hokage, it was his dream. Boy, dope. You're awfully quiet today, shouldn't you be at home anyway? You failed the test, don't you remember the Ichiha prodigy decided to harass the blonde? Naruto opened his mouth to respond, but noticed that, besides himself, Sasuke and Sakura were the only ones in the room. Hey, team, where's everyone else he asked. Sasuke raised an eyebrow at the boy, they all left with their sensei, we're the only ones left. Naruto blinked. Where's our sensei? The Ichiha shrugged and turned back to stare at the door. Sakura sighed and muttered something about late people and castration, but Naruto ignored her and grinned mischievously. He wanted to be late did he? Naruto bounded to the door and slid a chair over to it. He grabbed the eraser off the chalkboard and stood up on the chair. He was about to set the eraser up on the door when, Sakura asked, What are you doing, Naruto? Naruto opened his mouth to speak, but after thinking it over, he stepped off the chair and let the eraser drop to the floor. If he truly wanted to become Hokage he wouldn't be as stupid to piss off his sensei on the first day. Nothing. He walked back to his seat and sat down. He hadn't sat down for five seconds when the door opened and a silver-haired walked in. Naruto raised an eyebrow at his appearance. The man had a black mask covering the lower half of his face, and his hit I ate was worn crooked to cover his left eye. He glanced up at them lazily and gave a short, yo he, looked over them for a second, and Naruto suspected that he was sizing them up, seeing what his genin would be like this year. 
Meet me on the roof. He said simply and poofed out of the room. Sasuke Chen at and headed up the stairs, Sakura following him like a lost puppy. Naruto snorted and walked out the door. Once he got on the roof, he saw the others waiting for him. Hurry up, Naruto. Naruto shook his head at Sakura's scolding. He was finally seeing how she really treated him. Like shit. Naruto crouched in the bushes. His sensei was currently standing in the clearing ahead of him, reading that damnable book again. Despite the Jounin's helpless look the man was really quite capable. Sasuke was in front of the man, buried up to his neck by an earth, and the had also decapitated Sakura with a minor jinjutsu. The blonde rubbed his arm again. The damn thing was driving him borderline insane. It was burning like crazy and every now and then he'd have sharp pains in the palm of his hand, like someone in there was trying to hack their way out with a knife. Returning to the situation at hand, he had come to a realization. Naruto had no clue how he was going to do this. The test was to get the bells away from the whose name was now revealed as Kakashi, but Sasuke could barely touch them, and as much as Naruto hated to admit it, the Ichiha really was a better ninja than him. Naruto sighed. Kakashi throughout the whole fight with Sasuke had never taken his nose out of his book and had displayed speed that Naruto knew he couldn't match. He glanced at the pond that was settled right behind the silver-haired ninja. The grin spread across his face as a plan formed in his head. After he had made his preparations, Naruto stepped out of the brush and into the clearing. The glance lazily up from his book, but otherwise showed no signs of moving. Naruto sighed and steeled himself, before he charged. He lashed out with a fist that Kakashi caught with his free hand. Kakashi then drove his knee into Naruto's gut, making the genin gasp for air. You're really slow he commented as he took a step back. Naruto grinned, and you're really stupid. Thus the 10 cage bunshin came flying out of the pond behind Kakashi, letting loose a hail of kunai. Kakashi was able to dodge, but barely. By the time he had regained his bearings, Naruto was upon him and reached out to grab the bells. The silver-haired leapt back, creating some distance. Naruto growled. He still had that damn book. Kakashi glanced at him. Is that all that you have? The blonde glared and made a few seals. Cage bunch and no jutsu there was a poof of smoke, and where Naruto had once stood there were now 20 clones, all of them charging Kakashi. The dodged a punch, but then had to instantly duck below a kick. One Naruto threw a kunai that connected with his back, before he turned into a log. The clones stopped attacking and looked around. He wasn't anywhere in the clearing as far as they could see. One of the clones pointed in the middle of the crowd. Hey, look at that he pointed again at the small white piece of paper on the ground, that looks like a The explosive tag chose just then to ignite, destroying all but five of the Naruto's. After the smoke from the blast cleared, there was Kakashi, leaning against a stump, staring at Naruto boredly. The silver haired yawned into his hand. Naruto scowled and ran forward, sweeping out with his legs, Kakashi easily dodged and caught Naruto's wild follow-up punch at the wrist. The silver haired man quickly had to let go, however, as a left hook came searching for his face. The blonde tried to roundhouse kick the, but it was easily blocked with the man's spare forearm. This seemed only to infuriate the blonde even more. Nothing was working. He had thought that his cage bunch and trick would have at least gotten him a bell, but it hadn't even phased the lazy ninja in front of him. Naruto lashed out with his fist, but this time he overextended and Kakashi kicked his feet out from under him. He slammed into the hard ground and it took him a few minutes to get up again. When he was finally standing straight up he sent his sensei a fierce glare. This test was impossible. Naruto almost charged again, but thought better of it. He would just waste time and energy. If only there was someone else his eyes widened, but he quickly covered it up. Sasuke was just on the edge of the clearing, if he could distract Kakashi long enough, he might be able to get over there and bury him out. Naruto grinned at his sensei, before running towards the tree line. Kakashi was internally frowning. So far his new team had been pretty unimpressive. Sasuke was a loner, and wouldn't ask anyone for help. Sakura was a fangirl and was more concerned about her makeup than about being a shinobi. And Naruto, well, he didn't know what to think of Naruto. The boy had determination. And he had constructed a nice pincer maneuver by hiding his clones in the pond behind him and coming in from the front. But from what Kakashi could see, he had next to no tojutsu skills, knew no other besides cage bunshin, and heavily favored headlong rushes, something that will get you killed in Anbu, or even missions. But the blonde had actually taken a hit in order to get his plan done. Sure, it had been a weak hit, not even using a fraction of Kakashi's real strength, but still, the boy had what it took to be a ninja. If only he could figure out the purpose of the test, then he saw the blonde's eyes flicker over to Sasuke for a minute, before he ran off to the trees Kakashi grinned. He might finally be able to pass a team, then Naruto suddenly leaped out of the trees surrounding the clearing, bearing down on Kakashi from above. The copy nin ducked and weaved and managed to avoid all the clones, that is, until one of the clones substituted himself with a log that was sitting behind Kakashi, getting him directly behind the dot. 
the Kashi suddenly felt arms close around him from behind, making him unable to dodge the mob of clones that were charging at him. The first bunch and landed a kick to the man's chin, snapping his head back, only for the to burst into smoke. All the cage bunchons were suddenly dispelled as the real Naruto took a hit to the face. What the hell, team? What was that for? Sasu glared, I could have gotten out myself. Naruto snorted, yeah, sure. You were only sitting there for 20 minutes. Oh, I could have. The Chiha was cut off as he and Naruto were suddenly swept up in a net. It pulled them up off the ground and they dangled there, helpless. Kakashi jumped down from the tree above the net, smiling at them as he pulled out his book. You two get along quite well. Dottie drew. Naruto grinned and Kakashi stiffened, that was the same look he'd had before. Naruto and Sasuke suddenly burst into smoke. Page Bunshin. Peyton Kakaku no Jutsu Kakashi barely rolled out of the way before the fireball flew past, singing his hair. Unfortunately for him, he rolled right towards a hail of kunai thrown by five Naruto's up in a tree. The leaped out of the way, having to knock one of the projectiles away with his hand. It was still in the air when Sasuke attacked with a flurry of punches. Kakashi blocked all of them, having to put his book away to do so. When the copy nin finally landed, he was assaulted by Sasuke and Naruto, the Achiha using Tejutsu and the blonde throwing kunai. Despite the onslaught of attacks, Kakashi showed no signs of slowing down, and he could tell that they were tiring. If only they had one more person helping, he thought. The copy nin leaned backwards to avoid a spinning kick from Sasuke and grabbed the kunai that would have impaled his chest with his right hand, sending it flying back at Naruto, who to Kakashi's surprise, burst into smoke. Another cage bunshin. But then where's the real Jounin's eyes widened when he took a step backwards and felt a thin wire snap against the back of his heel. The nin rolled instinctively to the right and avoided the rain of kunai that came down from above. He stood up and had to avoid another fireball from Sasuke by leaping to the right. The real Naruto's been setting traps while his clone has been tricking me. I've been so absorbed into dodging their attacks that I failed to notice the switch, they could pretty much do anything now, I have no idea where Naruto is. But then again, he looked at Sasuke, who was bent over trying to recover some energy. Sasuke's almost completely drained of chakra, and seeing all those cage bunch in Naruto has made, he has to be nearing his limit as well. Naruto jumped down from the trees and landed in front of Kakashi. The copy nin shook his head and sighed, Naruto he started, you do know that you just ruined a perfect opportunity to catch me by surprise. The boy smiled, yep he threw a kunai off to his right, cutting a rope that had been concealed in the brush. Akashi's eyes widened and he tried to dodge, but this time the infamous copy ninja was a little too slow. The loop that he had been standing in caught his ankles and tightened, lifting him off the ground. The Naruto cheered. We finally got you. Sasuke grunted at the other boy's enthusiasm, but inside he was smirking. If he was able to catch this off guard, then his skills were improving, and that meant he was that much closer to Itachi. Akashi smiled at them, I must say I'm impressed, you two work really well together, however he paused, looking them over, you still haven't gotten the bells, and while you've been patting yourselves on the back, you've given me time to escape. The suddenly disappeared in smoke, leaving only the dangling rope where he had been. Naruto's jaw dropped. They'd had him. His fists clenched as his anger grew. Damn that Kakashi, nothing works against him. There was a sudden thump next to Naruto, and he groaned when he saw Sasuke unconscious on the ground, his chakra exhaustion finally getting the best of him. Damn team, Samichiha prodigy, he can't even handle a little fight. Bakashi appeared in front of Naruto with a swirl of leaves. He glanced at Sasuke and smiled, well, Naruto, it looks like you're out of luck, you guys have failed the test, looks like you won't ever be a real ninja. Naruto scowled, Wadani means we failed, I'm still standing, and I can still get those damn bells. Akashi glanced at him skeptically, or at least, it looked like skepticism, it was hard to tell with his face. Naruto, you have just graduated from the academy and are the dead last of your group. I am one of the strongest in Konoha. If I was another academy student like Sasuke, then you might have a chance. You and Sasuke together couldn't do it and I was only using a fraction of my real abilities. You have failed the test because without your teammates, you can't beat me. I guess you won't be Hokage after all. Naruto put his head down, his bangs covering his eyes. Blood dripped down his clenched fists as his fingernails bit into the skin of his palm. Dead last, huh? Well I show you who's dead last, you nonsense. Kakashi's eyes widened as Naruto charged, much faster than ever before. The boy swung a fist, Kakashi blocked it with the palm of his hand, but marveled at the force behind it. The boy was fighting like he was still fresh, nothing showed of the drained and tired boy that had been standing before him, now there was just a raging storm of flying punches and vicious kicks. Naruto didn't know what it was that pissed him off, if it was his sensei's smug attitude, his denial that Naruto's dream would ever come true, or just failing the test in general. But something had clicked, and now he was pressing the attack, forcing his sensei to block his punches, and not giving him time to counter-attack. He would wipe that smug look off of his face. 
But no matter how hard he tried, or how hard he pushed, he could never break through the Jounin's guard. The blonde gritted his teeth as another solid kick was knocked away, and then a left hook. God damn it Naruto threw a punch with his right hand, the hardest so far. Kakashi blankly caught the arm by its wrist. Naruto suddenly fell to his knees as stabbing pain resounded through his arm. His hand. Oh, Kami his hand. He could feel it. Something was pushing its way out, not forcing its way out, and it felt like someone had stabbed a katana down the length of his arm and then poured salt water down the wound. Deep inside his navel, Kairubi grinned. Bakashi gained a concerned look when Naruto suddenly collapsed to the ground in pain. The Kapinin was still holding his arm, and he could feel the muscles tightening and contracting. When the boy screamed out in pain, Kakashi froze. He had never heard the boy make a peep when hurt. When Kakashi was in the Anbu, he was the one that had always found the boy being beaten by the villagers, one time he had been impaled by one of the local farmer's pitchforks, he was only six years old at the time, and had never made a peep, as the hospital staff had removed it. He had been beaten mercilessly and had never made a sound, taking it all with a defiant look on his face. But now, Naruto screamed again as another surge of pain racked his body. He had never felt anything like this before. He had been attacked and hurt in every way imaginable by the villagers, they had even placed a bucket of sulfuric acid above the door in his apartment, so that when he walked in it dumped on him. He was in the hospital for a whole week after, the longest he'd ever been in one. But that had felt like nothing compared to this. He felt the muscles in his arm convulse, and something almost as thick as his wrist came shooting out of his arm. The thing was razor sharp, and it had shot out before Kakashi could react. There was a thump. Blood was spilt, Saratobi rubbed his temples as he dejectedly stared at the mountain of paperwork that had decided to position itself on his desk. Really, the man that had created the dreadful thing called paper had to be directly related to Satan himself. Or at least that was Sandame's thoughts. What other logical reason was there for something so horrible to exist in this world? The age-worn Hokage took a puff from his pipe, blowing the foul-smelling smoke out with a slow wheeze as he stared out the window, forgetting the less rewarding duty of being Hokage as his thoughts drifted to his favorite blonde. Naruto would be taking his genin exam today. Well, he was probably close to finishing now, and Suratobi was concerned about him keeping his status as a shinobi of Konoha. If Naruto had been on any other team, with any other sensei, Suratobi wouldn't have given a second thought to the idea of him not passing, but he wasn't on just any team with any sensei, he was on the same team as his crush and his rival, and with Naruto that was just asking for trouble. Not only that, but he was on Hada Kakashi's team, the man that had turned down some of the most prodigal genin Kanoha had ever produced because they hadn't passed his test. And, to add to his worries, Iruka had come in earlier that morning, after the teams had been announced. He had reported that Naruto had been acting strange. Those who knew the blonde boy would expect him to be ecstatic to finally be a genin of the leaf, it was the first step on the way to his dream of being Hokage. But Aruka had reported that the boy had been late for class not that this was unusual, but one would expect a little more punctuality on such an important occasion, and that he had been observed through the listing of team assignments, staring off into space or absently tugging at his newly acquired headband that now rested on his forehead. The last thing Aruka had said was that the boy had made no visible reaction to being placed on the same genin unit as Haruno Sakura and Ichiha Sasuke. This greatly worried the Hokage. There was not a time that he had visited Naruto that the boy was not going on and on about the pink-haired girl. He was always saying how great as Sakura-chan was and how he hated the Ichiha theme. Saratobi sighed and stuffed some more tobacco into his pipe, relighting it after it was subsequently filled with the ill-scented substance. He only had a chance to take one puff before one had a Kakashi walk through his door without knocking. Saratobi noted that the Kapinin was missing the orange-covered book that usually occupied his attention, and blinked when he noticed that there was a deep gash across the man's cheek. The old Hokage grinned. I take it that your genin had some surprises for you, eh, Kakashi? The silver-haired nin glanced up at the Hokage with a serious look, somewhat out of place considering his usual lazy complexion. I guess you could say that he said, albeit a little shakily. Saratobi raised a questioning eyebrow and Kakashi explained, I certainly didn't expect this he touched the side of his cheek through his ripped mask, his fingers coming back crimson, if that's what you were referring to. The Hokage was curious, did they pass? Bakashi paused considerately for a moment before replying. Yes, I suppose they did, though the circumstances in which they did are somewhat odd. After receiving another inquisitive glance from the Hokage, he decided to get straight to the point. The boy Uzumaki Naruto here here received a nod, encouraging him to go on. Well, he has something that I haven't seen since before Karigakur started its bloodline purge. The man paused, noticing the wide eyed look the Hokage now wore. I assume that you know who the boy's parents were, Hokage-sama, so could you please explain to me why the container of the Kaiubi has Shikatsunyaku, the Keke Genkai of the Kagaya clan. Tsuritobi sighed once again. Do the other members of his team know about this? 
The Kashi shook his head, no, they had been incapacitated by the time it had been revealed. Ichiha Sasuke suffered from mild chakra exhaustion, so I dropped him off on the way here. And I escorted Sakura home. Sanding frowned. And what of Naruto? He went home, looked a little shaken up, and said he needed to get some sleep. The Hokage closed his eyes and exhaled some of his pipe smoke, before addressing the Kapinin. The Kashi-san, what I am about to tell you has been a closely guarded secret, only two people are still living that know of it. This is beyond S-class information, and I hope that you will not tell this to anyone, or I will personally see to it that your status as a Kanoha ninja is revoked, and that you are banished from the village of Kanahagakur, do I make myself clear. The Kashi's eye widened slightly, but he hesitantly nodded. Good, then Dot Saratobi rested his elbows on his desk, intertwining his fingers. Well, I am sure you know the history of the Kagaya clan's demise. The Kashi nodded his head, I know that they had attacked Kurigakur in an attempt to stop the extermination of their clan, and were killed by a large-scale assault, led by the Mizukage himself. Ah, that barely scratches the surface of a Dot Siratobi, poured himself a glass of water from the jug he kept beside his desk, offering Kakashi one also, who politely refused. Quenching his thirst, the Hokage continued. You are correct in saying that the Kagaya clan attacked Kurigakur, and that the bloodline purge was part of the reason. I don't understand, Hokage-sama. Sandame shook his head lightly, I would expect not, it is not common information, but the Kagaya clan head, Kagaya Hikyu, was partially insane during the end of his reign. He ruled much as the late Ichihas did, but he had the Kagaya's rays to be much fiercer than any precedented clan, even the Ichiha or the Hyuga. Hikyu had all Kagaya men trained to fight from the age of five, and any women that could not pull their weight as ninja were slaughtered. It was harsh, but it effectively did just what Hikyu wanted, it turned the Kagaya clan into an army, and with their bloodline, they wiped out many minor villages that wouldn't surrender to their might. You see, after Kagaya Hikyu started his tyrancy, the Kagaya clan was plunged headfirst into wars that they had no desire to be in, their leader led them into a battlefield and basically left them to fight for their lives. This strategy was greatly despised by the Kagaya, as many women and children were killed in the confusion, and sometimes the warriors couldn't tell the difference between friend and foe, often killing comrades as well as enemies. But, with this hands-on tactic, the Kagaya grew to be one of the most feared people on the face of the planet, a threat even to most ninja villages, proven by their conquest over southern water country. Sometime around this point, Hikyu had found himself a wife. Well, more accurately, elected himself a wife. The woman, or should I say girl as she was only 18 years of age, had no say in the matter, and when she tried to resist she was threatened with torture and even death. After a year or so, Hikyu and his wife had a son, the next heir to the throne, you would say. Many thought that having a child would soften the cold-hearted clan head and stop his tirade. Needless to say, they were wrong. Having a child did not affect Hikyu's cold-hearted nature in the least. From the moment his son could walk he was trained, against his wife's will, I might add, and a decade or so later after several more wars, Hikyu had successfully turned his son into the perfect living, breathing weapon. The Sandame paused for a moment, letting Kakashi soak in. The Kapinin had absolutely no idea where this was going, but he decided to be patient and wait to hear what the old Hokage had to say. After a minute's silence, Saratobi continued. Hikyu's son was seen as a prodigy among the Kagaya, not a small feat considering their skills as shinobi. The boy was locked up by his own father by the time he was 10 years old, only brought out to destroy the rare enemy that managed to put some pressure on the clan. By the time this boy was 13, he had taken more lives than most of the Inkonoha, including Yukakashi. It was around this time when the Kagaya clan was suffering from population issues, the side effect of their war living existence. By this time Hikyu was old and weak, but far from fragile. When he heard of Kuridaku's bloodline purge, he ordered an all-out attack on the village. Many believed that if the Kagaya clan had not been so far from the greatness they once had been, that they would have won the battle and destroyed Kuridaku. But as it was, the Kagaya's army was depleted, and though they fought valiantly, they were eventually defeated, crushed beneath the might of Kiri. Saratobi set his tobacco-less pipe on the table and held up his forefingers. There were only two survivors, Hikyu's son, whose location had been a mystery until recently, and his wife, who fled to Whirlpool country, changing her name and hiding among the relatively peaceful natives. There she stayed for two whole years, and when Whirlpool was wiped out she fled once again, this time stumbling deep into the woods. A traveling merchant found her outside a few miles outside our gates and brought her here, where she met the Yandame, who had just become Hokage at that time. The Kashi's eyes widened, but that would mean that Naruto's. The Hokage nodded. Yuzumaki Naruto is the son of Namakas Minato, 4th Hokage of Kanahagakur, and Yuzumaki Kashina, formerly known as Kugai Kashina. Holy shit. Naruto closed the door to his apartment with a small click as the lock swung into place. 
The blonde flipped the light switch on and walked over to his bedroom, falling backwards onto the mattress and staring absently at the ceiling. Resting his right arm across his chest, he heaved a great sigh and brought his left hand up into his view. In it he held a three-foot-long, two-inch thick piece of white something. His first thought would be to call it a bone, but that couldn't be right. Whoever heard of someone's bone shooting out of their arm? Then again, they would have spoken about it during one of the academy lectures. He had never really listened to those, he was usually either sleeping or planning his next prank, while Aruka was teaching. Now that he thought of it, he could vaguely remember something about people being born with special abilities, something called Kikoi. Kekaka. He scowled, he could quite remember the name. He thought about it for a moment longer before snorting. I've been born with something, but it sure as hell ain't special. He self-consciously rubbed his navel. And besides, even if this is some kind of ability from it, I'll never use something that came from a demon. Trying to quell his anger, he slowly stood up, grunting with the toll it took on his sore muscles. He hobbled to the bathroom and closed the door. Slipping his clothes off, he quietly walked over and turned the shower head on, this time remembering to wait a minute for the water to warm up. Carefully stepping in, he closed the shower curtain and relished in the heat the hot water brought to his cramped muscles. The blonde rolled his neck and stretched his arms above his head. Putting his hand out to lean on the shower wall, he stood in the relaxing warm water for a while longer before he started to wash himself, grabbing a bar of soap as he scrubbed his body. After he felt he was sufficiently clean, he grabbed a bottle of shampoo, squirting a teaspoon-sized glob onto his palm and smashed it into his hair, rubbing it in with his hands. As he ran his fingers through his hair, he once again noticed something off. His hair was usually mangy and unmanageable, he usually had difficulty cleaning his hair because of the fact that it was constantly knotting up. But now, his fingers slid between the strands without resistance, the shampoo washing out easily, instead of getting caught in the wire mesh that was usually his hair. He turned, frowning to look in the mirror, almost falling over when he saw his reflection. When the hell had his hair gotten so light-colored? He hesitantly grabbed a lock of his hair, studying it. Kami, when he had left for the academy that morning his hair had been its usual dishwater blonde, but now it resembled Eno's hair color. In fact, it was so light-colored that the end of each strand of hair almost looked white. He sneered at the thought that it almost made him look like that nonsense Mizuki. If that wasn't enough, Naruto almost smashed the stupid mirror when he found that those annoying red dots hadn't disappeared off of his forehead. He growled under his breath. What the hell is happening to me, goddammit. He stood there for another minute before a loud growl from his stomach alerted him of the absence of food in his belly. Turning off the water, he grabbed a towel wrapping it around his waist as he ambled into the kitchen. He had to get something to eat if he was going to be able to do anything. Naruto strangely felt against having his usual favorite, so he skipped the instant Raymond cupboard and opened the fridge, looking for something within its meager contents. He finally grabbed a half-full carton of eggs, a few slices of cheese, and a large chunk of meat of some kind. He shrugged, it was probably a gift from the Hokage or something, the old man had been constantly on his diet ever since he had become an academy student. He searched the cupboards and found a pan that wasn't too dirty. He turned his single burner stove on low and set the pan on top of the burner, tossing in a small hunk of butter, before returning to the counter to grab a pair of eggs, cracking them open and dumping the insides into the pan, also. He sat down at the counter as the eggs cooked and checked the meat carefully. He hesitantly brought the chunk up to his nose and took a whiff. He blinked and shrugged. It smelled alright. He'd fry it up and see what happened. Taking a kunai out of his pocket he twirled it around his finger twice, before bringing it to bear on the piece of meat. He started cutting them into thin slabs at first, but eventually started doing bigger ones, because of the time it took to get little slices. But with his distracted brain, and his haste in getting done, he wasn't quite as carefully as he usually would have been, and as he was trying to hack through an especially tough part of the meat, the kunai slipped. Naruto didn't react fast enough to the sudden lack of resistance, and the kunai stabbed straight into the middle of his forearm. Should he hissed. He quickly reached out for some paper towels to stop the incoming blood. He was stopped however, but a loud clanging sound. Glancing back his eyes widened as he realized the kunai that he'd had was now on the floor of his kitchen. Taking a glance at his arm he was surprised to see a small puncture wound, about the size of the head of a thumbtack. What the hell, he thought as he rubbed his hand over the hole in his arm, which was already healing up. That should have cut halfway through my arm. Why did it stop so soon? It didn't even bleed. Naruto bent over and picked up the kunai, almost falling off of his chair when he saw that the tip of it was blunted. I just sharpened all of these yesterday. What the hell is going on? He scowled as he realized he didn't have an answer, and filed it away to ask the Hokage about it later. He didn't get a chance to ponder the issue further, as the smell of burning eggs reached his nostrils. He was able to save them in time to still be edible, but it wasn't the best meal he'd ever had. After he finished he stacked up the dishes beside the sink and walked into his bedroom. 
he dropped his towel, slipping on a pair of boxers before climbing into his bed and succumbing to the welcoming hold of sleep. What will you do? The Hokage sighed in relief at the question. Kakashi had been ranting and raving about why he wasn't told and what he would have done if he had been told and what would have happened had the villagers been told. The sand aim had been about ready to screw the title of Hokage and strangle the silver-haired regardless. Um, I would think that I would contact his relative next. Akashi's eyes widened, Hokage-sama, that Kagaya boy is a threat to the village, you can't possibly bring him here. And even if you could, the council would never allow it. The Hokage smiled, leave the council to me. Akashi was still doubtful, how are you going to get a hold of him, do you even know where he is? The Hokage rubbed his temples. Yes, Kakashi, I know where Kamimura that's the boy's name is. He had disappeared for a long time, you know, but recently Jiraiya's spy network picked up on him. However, his location is somewhat of a tricky subject and it won't risky to get a hold of him. But, if Naruto doesn't learn how to control that blood limit of his, he could end up killing somebody. The copy nin nodded in agreement before asking, where is this boy Kamimuro, Hokage-sama? Saratobi took a puff from his pipe, which hadn't been there a moment ago, and answered somewhat hesitantly. Jiraiya's spy network has been keeping tabs on Orochimaru lately, and it seems that he's starting to form a village called Atagakur, I believe it's called. The village hidden in the sound. It seems that Kamimuro joined Orochimaru shortly after the massacre, and is currently being held in Atagakur as Orochimaru's next vessel. The Hokage added with disgust. Akashi cocked an eyebrow at the Hokage, how are you ever gonna get a message to him? And if you do, are you sure that he won't just relay that message to Orochimaru? He probably doesn't have the highest opinion of his family, considering what you've told me. Tsuritobi nodded, yes, it will be tricky to get him to come, especially with the loyalty he shows the snake, however, it is a simple matter to get the message to him. And I already have a letter prepared. The Hokage dug out a scroll and held it up as if to prove it. The Kashi was still shooting him a questioning look. The Hokage smiled, I can't believe you haven't thought of it yet, Kakashi. Thought of what? Tsuritobi smiled wider before biting his thumb hard, drawing blood. He rapidly made hand seals, slamming his hands onto the floor he yelled, Kuchius no jutsu in a puff of smoke the Monkey King Enma stood before them. Enma observed the office for a moment before addressing the Hokage. Saratobi, what have you summoned me for? The aged Hokage grinned. Enma, I have a job for one of your monkeys. Three days later, the Mimro scowled as the little chimp dispelled itself in a puff of smoke, its mission completed. After he was sure the scruffy little monkey was gone, he released his hold on the glare and focused his attention on the scroll he now held in his hand. If he was surprised at the Hokage seal that held it shut he didn't show it. He studied it for a moment longer before reaching to break the seal. The white-haired nin stopped suddenly, glancing toward the door. The lock clicked and he quickly stuffed the scroll into the inside of his light kimono. He would show it to Orochimaru sama later if it was anything that he should be worried about. The door swung open, and the thin form of Kabuto appeared in the doorway. How are you, Kamimro kun the med nin asked, a smile on his face as he walked towards the bone user. The Mimro glared slightly, all too familiar with the boy's twisted little game. Do not concern yourself with my condition, trash. If it wasn't against Orochimaru sama's wishes I would kill you right now. The Budo smile widened a bit, ah, always nice meeting with you, Kamimro kun dot the nin reached into his pouch and tossed a little bottle over to the white-haired leader of the sound for, your medicine. I would stay and be pleased with your presence, however, Orochimaru sama hasn't been feeling very well lately with that Kabuto bowed lightly, almost mockingly, before stepping out of the room and closing the door behind him. The Mimro snorted, trash ninja, glancing at the bottle in his hand he rolled it in his hands a few times before pitching it at the wall, the hard surface shattering it on impact, sending thousands of glass shards to the floor. He coughed one hand as his other pulled the scroll out of his kimono. He took a moment to search for any incoming chakra signatures, but was relieved when he felt no one but the ordinary ninja running around, and all of them knew not to bother him. The last Chunin that had come into his room unannounced had been impaled with six bone bullets before he could blink. A Shikatsum Yaku user broke the seal and quietly unrolled the scroll, blinking in surprise when he saw that the scroll was addressed to him personally. What would the Hokage want with him? He pondered it for a moment before deciding to find out. He silently began reading. The Mimro's eyes were wide by the time he had finished reading the letter. The scroll itself had fallen out of his hands and now laid forgotten on the floor next to his medical bed. It couldn't be true. There. Was. No. Way. The Mimro had searched for hours for survivors, but he had never found anything but the mutilated bodies of his former family. But he had never found his mother's body. He pushed that thought out of his mind. His mother was the only one that had ever shown him any love. His father had been a cold-hearted nonsense, and all of the rest of his family had treated him like a freak of nature, a weapon only to be used in extreme war. Surely if his mother had survived she would have looked for him, right? The Mimro violently smashed these thoughts back into the back of his mind. 
He wouldn't think of such things, he had given up that past life when he had come to work for Rachimaru Sama. And yet if he had truly thrown that life away, then it had come right back to bite him with this scroll. If what was said in this scroll was true, and if it had truly come from the Hokage himself, then that would mean that Kimimuro not only had a family member left, but an actual brother. But, there were many reasons they would try to call him out. They could just be trying to draw him out to kill him and take a powerful warrior out of Arachimaru Sama's army. Or they could be trying to torture him to gain information to gain information about a Togakur. And again at this thought Kamimuro lowered his eyes slightly, he wasn't much of a benefit to Orochimaru sama in his current situation anyway, more of a hindrance really, seeing as how Orochimaru had to waste some of his best medics tending to the bone user. And thinking about it, he didn't know much about a Togakur that Kanoha hadn't already been told by their spy network, certainly not enough information to ruin Orochimaru samas plans. In any case, he wasn't of any use as a vessel anymore and definitely not as a fighter. As he thought over what he had just received, he realized that he had absolutely nothing to lose. Nothing. It was a strange word, but it was the bane of Kamimuro's existence. To be nothing, or to be useful for nothing, would be letting him win. If Kamimuro was ever useless, as he was now, he would be letting Kagaya Haikyuu win. And that was something he could not tolerate. Making his decision he opened the window on the eastern wall of his room and leapt out into the night, the dying words of his father echoing in his mind. You are useless Kamimuro. You amount to nothing, and that is the way it will always be. You and any Kagaya after you, will be known as the disgrace that our mighty clan left behind. You. Are. Nothing. He would prove that nonsense wrong, and he would do it with his own younger son. Naruto tugged nervously at the jet black bandana that now covered his head, a nervous habit he'd picked up over the last few days. He'd spent most of his time in solitude locked in his apartment, on some occasions that he would have to leave most of the time to swing by Ichiraku's, but he'd pretty much kept a low profile since his sudden change in appearance. He'd had a few uneasy meetings with his team, most of the time they just had some light sparring or went out to lunch. Though Naruto hardly cared about what the damn villagers thought anymore, he held his fellow academy students' opinions in high regard well, most of them. The team could go to hell, along with his harpy fangirls. Ducking his head, the genin weaved his way through an especially thick crowd of civilians, making his way towards the edge of town, where Training Ground 7 was located. That morning a brown messenger pigeon had tapped at his window mercilessly until he awoke. He had been about to wring the little devil's neck when he discovered that there was a note attached to its foot, scrawled on with a lazy, withered type of text that he'd expect from Kakashi. Training Ground. 12.30. Mission. Attic, Naruto groaned to himself. The man was too lazy to even write full sentences on his letters, but the prospect of a mission spurred his interest. Reaching a strand of trees, he leaped through them, before coming into a wide clearing with two occupants Kakashi obviously being the one absent. Sasuke sat propped up against a single scarred tree stump, his eyes halfway closed and his head down. As Naruto entered the clearing he regarded him with a cool eye, his black pits focused on Naruto for a few moments, before he let out a HN and re-averted his gaze back towards the ground. Sakura shot him a wary glance. The girl had given up on Sasuke for the moment and was sitting in the grass a few feet away. She didn't know what to think of the blonde since he'd stopped jazzing her around and calling her Chan. It was very sudden, and it was almost saddening. He had been her most loyal admirer, and one day he just quit. Naruto sighed and collapsed against a large rock just a few feet away from the Achiha. The boys had developed a sort of silent understanding, even if Naruto still thought the Achiha was nonsense during the previous team meetings. They had often eaten in silence away from the rest of their team though, part of this was because Naruto wasn't really comfortable around Kakashi since he almost killed him. Naruto could see the pain in the other boy's eyes. Even though the blonde didn't exactly like Sasuke, he held him in mild respect. After all, Naruto's been at the funeral of the Achiha clan. He held his sympathy from showing however, he knew from experience that the last thing an orphan wants is pity, whether from a best friend or a stranger, pity doesn't do anyone any good. The blonde shifted uncomfortably under his teammates' glances. They had stopped vocalizing their questions about his new headwear, but that didn't keep their eyes from asking. Deciding to get the attention off of himself, he sat up. Oi, did you hear something about a mission he asked, trying and failing miserably at keeping his excitement bailed. Sasuke nodded quickly, his expression lighter than usual, not set into its usual scowl. Naruto let a small smile find its way onto his face, it seemed he wasn't the only one interested. Do you think Hokage-sama will actually give us a mission Sakura asked hesitantly. Naruto scowled, well, why wouldn't he? 
I've seen the old man give missions to Jenin before, and we're Jenin, so we should get missions right he brought a kunai out and started spinning it on his finger, anyway, that perverted nonsense of the sensei better not have just called us out here for nothing. Just then there was a puff of smoke, and Kakashi appeared, his single eye drooped down into what his students had come to think of as a smile. Naruto grinned, oi, pervert. What's this about a mission? Kakashi ignored his question and observed his three students, all of which were looking at him expectedly. If they only knew, he was trying desperately to keep from giggling, oh this would be fun. The Sharingan user pulled out a vest from his vest, tossing it to Sasuke. From the hokage he drawled, almost falling over with laughter when he saw their ecstatic expressions. Sasuke slowly unrolled the scroll, his teammates breathing down his neck. Bakashi could see their eyes widen in surprise as they skimmed the mission assignment. I never thought having a genin team could be so fun. The Mimro sat on a branch, in deep thought. He was just outside of Kanoha's walls, resting in a large pine. It was ridiculously easy to get this far, Kanoha's sweeper teams were pathetic at best, passing right beneath him as he leaped through the trees. The only time he'd had trouble was when he ran into a team with a nin dog accompanying them. It had taken some creative thinking trying to outsmart the dog's nose, but he'd managed. They'd only been trash after all. He sighed, albeit quietly. Even if Kanoha nin were shitty ninja, they weren't deaf, and as much as he detested them, he doubted he could take an Anbu team in his current condition. Maybe with the curse seal, he shook his head. If he used that, Orochimaru would instantly be alerted to his position, and as much as Kamimuro admired it, this was something he did not want him involved in. He may have condemned himself to be Orochimaru's next body, but he'd be damned if he ever left another of his family to face the same fate. Especially if this was truly his mother's son. He somered at that thought. Kashina had been Kamimuro's sunshine. The woman would come to see him every day in his cage, bringing him snacks and other things that she was able to sneak past the bodyguards. She'd been one of the few to show him kindness, and the only one to treat him as something other than a human weapon. When his mother died, a small part of him had died with her. Horn and broken, that was when he found sanctuary with Orochimaru-sama. A snake had taken advantage of him, Kamimuro was not naive enough not to see that, but he would not let the man take his mother's son. Doing so would be disgracing her name, and that he'd rather die than taint his mother's legacy in any way. Kamimuro was knocked out of his thoughts as a loud cracking noise off to his left caught his attention. Muffled cursing soon followed, and soon the person responsible for the noise entered the clearing, before he could move. Ah, idiot Naruto swore as he cradled his bleeding cheek with one hand, the other occupied holding the small fury form of Satan. He'd spent all day chasing after this damn cat. Apparently, Genin missions weren't as glamorous if you can call brutally killing people glamorous as he'd originally thought. So far, the most action Naruto had seen has been chasing down lost pets or pulling weeds from one of the neighborhood gardens. Needless to say, he was less than pleased with his first few assignments as a shinobi of Konoha. He was a ninja, damn it. He didn't go through the horror of the academy to learn how to skin potatoes. He readjusted his grip on the little houseman that they'd been told was a cat, so that he had it by the scruff of its neck, where it couldn't do any more damage to his arms or his already thrashed orange jumpsuit. Naruto leapt up into the trees, breaking his way through the branches, as he made his way back toward Konoha, his team was probably waiting for him. After a moment, he discovered something strange, the cat had suddenly quit its attempted assault on his arms and was slumping in his grip. He scowled and was about to just pass it off as just another weird thing about the little monster, when he felt it. It started in his stomach. A sudden, helpless, sinking feeling that sat in the pit of his abdomen. It quickly spread throughout his body, his limbs tingling and losing feeling, his throat suddenly becoming cotton dry. His legs were glued to the branch he was on, refusing to carry him further. He repressed a shudder as the feeling surged, a great weight coming onto his shoulders. He faintly registered that he'd let go of the cat at some point. He'd felt it before, but never this intense. Killing intent. One of the most basic ninja skill, but also one of the most useful. Killing intent could completely immobilize any person ninja or not if used correctly. Most Anbu captains would swear by it. The intense chakra concentration penetrated a person's mind and stimulated either extreme fear or helplessness. Perfect for the use of shinobi. Naruto was currently on the wrong side of the Kai burst of the Kai. He was no stranger to the feeling, many people detested him, and not a few of them were ninja, so he'd had his share of experience with the stuff, but this killing intent was much more potent than he'd ever felt any of the Kanoha conjure up. He was able to turn his head enough to see his mind assailant. His eyes widened and his muscles tensed when he saw the appearance of the other nin. The man looked to be around Kakashi's height, though it was hard to tell the way he was curled up on that tree branch. He wore a loose white medical kimono that opened low, revealing the bandages that covered his chest. He had a pale complexion, and his dull cold gray eyes seemed to pierce right through Naruto as he stared at him. They were the eyes of a killer. Despite his intimidating form, that was not what held Naruto's attention. 
No, what the boy was focusing on was the man's silvery white hair that hung down from his head in thin strands, and the two distinct crimson dots that framed his forehead. No way, Naruto fraught the urge tremble as the weight in the air increased, forcing him to his knees. The white-haired man snorted and the Kai lessened slightly, just more trash he heard the man mutter, before the killer intent surged again, stronger than before. Then, the man held out his arm, and a bone emerged from the back of his wrist. Naruto did tremble this time, though not because of the influence of the killer intent. No, he reacted on fear, just plain terror. He tried desperately to move as the man leapt down, but to no avail. The taller man was standing right in front of him now, his attention focused on the younger Genin. The man brought down his arm, the bone blade came swinging down on him, like a pendulum from hell. Shit. Naruto's desperation gave him enough strength to roll away from the death blow, but he was too unfocused to catch himself as he slammed into the ground hard. The boy looked up to find the man leaping down from the tree, his feet making indents in the ground as he landed. He didn't have the power nor the time to put up any kind of defense, as a sharp kick impacted with his face. The loud crack resounded through the forest as Naruto was sent flying a few feet away, rolling to a stop against a large rock. It was by sheer force of will that Naruto was able to get himself to his feet. The killer intent was still strong, but the pain in his face and back was distracting him somewhat, but that wouldn't last for long, he could already feel the stinging in his jaw go down to a small ache as his healing ability kicked in. Run damn it. His legs trembled and took a few steps, but refused to further follow his commands, as the nin appeared right in front of him, the suddenness of his approach caused Naruto's legs to finally give out from underneath him, and he soon found himself on his back. The man brought up his unarmed limb and delivered a vicious punch to Naruto's chest. The boy felt the air leave his lungs in a big gust, and was too dazed to react to the backhand that caught him in the cheek, sending him flying. He tumbled to a stop and propped himself up on his arms, staring fearfully at the man who apparently was going to kill him. But then he realized something. The nonsense was smiling. Naruto's eyes widened for a moment, before his fists clenched in anger. A low growl escaping his lips, the killer intent suddenly relinquishing its hold on him. The idiot didn't think it was enough to just kill him, but he had to play with him too. Well, he'd show this bitch what you got for messing with Yuzumaki Naruto. Free of his previous restraints, he took out a lone kunai and charged, a scream tearing itself from his throat as he approached the other nin. If the other man was surprised by his charge, he didn't show it, and calmly blocked the kunai with his bone sword, which was still attached to the back of his arm, extending a few feet beyond the length of his hand. Naruto brought his other hand around, hoping to catch the man off guard, but to no avail. The white-haired nin easily latched onto his fist with practiced grace, and in the same motion planted a kick in Naruto's chest. The boy was sent sprawling, his kunai flying from his hand as he desperately tried to get back into position to block, but couldn't in time to stop elbow that slammed into his solar plexus, stinging his abdomen with pain, and knocking the air out of him for the second time. Through the haze of pain, Naruto was able to see the man disappear suddenly. There was a flash of white, and a sudden pain flared on the back of his neck. Then everything went black. The Mimro scowled at the orange-clad ninja he just knocked out. He had to admit, he was surprised at the genin's performance. The boy had managed to move under the killer intent barrage he'd put him under, and had actually been able to attack, which was a feat in and out of itself. Certainly for a genin. But that, of course, was not what piqued Kamimro's interest. The boy, as he was looking down at him now, was no worse for wear than when he had first wandered into the clearing which made no sense whatsoever. The single kick Kamimro had delivered to the boy's face should have broken the boy's jaw and, more than likely, a few teeth. But now that he observed him, there wasn't a single mark on him in that area or anywhere else on his body. The Mimro had dealt out three hits to the boy's chest during the course of their little fight. With the freakish strength his dense bones added to his attacks, the boy's ribs had should be in horrible condition right now, but he'd examined the boy and not a single thing was out of place. The former sound nin could tell that the boy had some sort of healing ability, by the way his bruises were already losing their purplish color, but the speed that they were healing was not equivalent to the speed that the bones must have healed, and Kamimro highly doubted that this ability would work faster repairing complex internal injuries as opposed to simple external scratches. That meant that they must not have broken. The scowl deepened. That would be impossible. There was no way, with the force he had put behind his blows, that nothing had broken. When Juugo had gone berserk, it had been Kamimro that had to stop him, and even in his demon form, his forearms had broken when he tried to block Kamimro's attacks. The only way to avoid it was to use extreme chakra to reinforce the limbs which he was certain this boy could not do or. His eyes widened slightly, and he placed a hand on the boy's bandana covered head, ripping the garment off. Revealing pale white hair and two crimson dots stationed above his eyebrows. Amisama, this boy he was his brother. Kamimro slumped to the ground gracelessly. If this boy was along with himself the last of the Kagaya, then they really had fallen far. This boy could hardly be considered one of Kamimro's clan. 
it wasn't fair that this be all that was left of his mother, and again, Kamimro had learned long ago that things in life were hardly ever fair. But, for this trash, to be the last that was left of the only person he had ever loved it hurt. The boy dressed in orange for Kami's sake. Any decent ninja knew that you do not dress in bright vibrant colors when on missions, even minor ones, which his apparent half-brother had obviously been on. He snorted. Even the thought of being related to this boy made his nose wrinkle in distaste. In the letter he'd received from the Hokage, it had said that his relative probably wouldn't be what he expected, and he'd heeded the warning and prepared himself, but even he had never expected this. The boy was the son of the Yandame Hokage, one of the greatest ninja ever to arise in the Shinobi nations, and his own mother, who was one of the most potent users of the Shikatsun Yaku. Bringing this into the equation, there was no reason that he shouldn't be at least a Chunin by now. But the scroll had said that the Hokage would go into details when he got there, and he doubted the sand aim had meant for him to meet the boy beforehand. So he'd see the Hokage then. Standing up, he was going to start for the tower, when something hit him. Even if he had been able to get past the incompetent patrol teams, and even if Kano had truly had some shitty ninja within its ranks, you couldn't just walk into a hidden village unannounced, and certainly not when you were from an enemy village, even if that specific enemy village had not been officially declared an enemy yet. He pondered this for a few more moments before he discovered the solution, and it was so simple that he cursed his illness for befuddling his brain. The scroll he'd received from the Hokage contained the Hokage crest on it, so all he had to do was walk up to the gates, show it to the guards, and they'd let him in. Though, probably with one of those trash Anbu as an escort, but he'd burn that bridge when he got there. So he slung his newly found clanmate onto his shoulder and made his way towards Konoha's gates. A while later, it took Kamimro nearly a half an hour to reach the gates, with the added weight of the boy who at this point still woken up. The boy's eyes was rather misleading. He looked thin and not slightly malnourished, but was as heavy as a boulder. Of course, it was common for one with Kagaya blood to be heavier than most people, the boy's weight was just ridiculous. It was abnormal for even one from his clan to be this heavy, especially if what the scroll had said was true, and he had only awoken the Shikatsun Yaku a few days ago. It wasn't hard to guess why he was so damn heavy, it was the same reason most Kagaya never learned how to swim. Having a useful Keke Genkai never came without a catch. A few of the younger people in the clan had died because they had fallen into lakes or rivers and didn't know how to walk on water, their bones were too damn dense. When you have something that can withstand abuse like a Shikatsum Yaku bone can, it's gonna be heavy, and most people with its ability had the buoyancy of a steel pipe. But to think that this boy's bones were dense enough already to withstand abuse like he'd put them through Kami, even Kamimro's father had sported injuries after they had their less than friendly spars, and yet this boy came away without hardly a scratch. He shook his head, this was all very confusing. Kamimro had supposedly been summoned to train the boy, but the boy must have some control over his power. Shikatsumyaku was not automatic, it had to have the mental commander the chakra flow in order to activate, the boy had to have called it out to protect him. Unless, halt. State your business. He tensed for a moment almost drawing out a bone before he realized that it was just a miserable gate guard. Still, he kept his guard up. With trash you could never be too careful. The man was a tad shorter than Kamimro's shoulder and rather chubby for a ninja. His large stomach that bulged out from his chunin vest was a testament to this fact. The man sent a wary glance towards the boy that the bone user was holding, but upheld his stuck-up attitude. With his beady little eyes and pointy nose, he reminded Kamimro of a rat he hated. The chubby nin's face started to get red when he received no response from the taller, white-haired man. Coroner, state your business he huffed, clenching his small fists. Kamimro shot the short man with a look of disdain. If he was in sound, he would have killed this puny piece of trash in an instant. Sure, he had played with the boy that now rested on his shoulder, but he never had any intention of killing him. He doubted the Hokage would appreciate him decapitating this man, much as he would enjoy it. Coroner. Kamimro scowled now. This man was starting to get annoying. The little man was glaring up at him now, his face beat red with anger. If you have no business then I'll have to ask you to leave he shouted, standing up on his toes for emphasis. The Shikatsum Yaku user snorted. He hoped all ninjas in Kanoha weren't like this obnoxious little man. Nevertheless, he decided to avoid trouble and silently dug in his kimono for the scroll. As he was doing so he saw the midget of a shinobi tense, staring at him with suspicious eyes. Kamimro almost laughed. If he had been planning on pulling a weapon out on this sorry excuse for a ninja, he wouldn't have broadcasted it, and surely, if he had intended to kill this man his head would already be laying at his feet. He decided to spend a little extra time pulling out the scroll, and was rewarded as drops of sweat popped up like weeds on the fat man's brow. Finally he decided he had played long enough and fully removed his hand, revealing the scroll. Rolling it in his hand to show the Hokage crest, Kamimro smirked at the flabbergasted face that the man sported upon seeing the mark of his ruler. 
The man sputtered for a bit, sending Kamimro shocked expressions which the Xound Nin found very amusing before turning without a word and opening the gate. The Mimro smiled at the man as he passed and was rewarded as the chubby ninja's complexion paled considerably. Which was understandable, considering how the smile must have looked on the bone user's face. His reaction was just what the white-haired nin was shooting for. He chuckled lightly to himself. He couldn't kill the fools, but scaring the shit out of them was oddly satisfying. He made his way down the road leading into Konoha and after a few moments was walking through the streets of Konoha itself. The other people gave him a wide berth, which attested to his intimidating figure, most of the villagers sending him looks of fear or respect. Or both. There was also another expression on the faces of the villagers that confused him, however. Hate. The majority of people he passed sent a loathful gaze his way or muttered under their breath. It had him thoroughly confused until he realized that the people weren't looking at him at all, but rather at his passenger. The number of villagers glaring at the orange-clad Jenin and Kamimro, by association, was appalling. What even more confused him was when he heard one of the villagers mutter something akin to damn demon which only added to his confusion. The name wouldn't be far off when describing Kamimro he'd been called the same many times by enemies on the battlefield, but he had just arrived here and it was more than likely that no one here had heard of him, much less recognized him. And to call this boy that was simply strange. His first thought was that the name was more of a title than an actual accusation. Many ninja had been named things by their village based on their ninja skills, such an example was Abusa, the demon of the mist, back in Kiri. But he quickly dismissed these thoughts after a quick peek back into the memories of his own fight with the boy. Surely, his ninja skills were nothing impressive, he had potential, but as of now he was just another genin. So he came to the conclusion that the boy must have done something to earn the villagers' hate in some way. But what exactly he had done was beyond him, he couldn't think of anything short of murder that would spur a village to so venomously hate someone. Needless to say, his journey to the Hukage Tower which was placed in the center of the village, was less than pleasant. It was even worse when he felt the wary eyes of the local ninja on him, no doubt sensing his enormous chakra signature, no matter how hard he tried to mask it. Still, it was nice to know that there were at least a few capable shinobi in this village. By the time he reached the building, there were at least 30 ninja eyeing him from a distance. He was almost worried, here he was, a foreign ninja, and he was hefting a local ninja around on his shoulder. He thanked Kami for the boy's healing ability right now. Surely if he had brought in him barely hanging on to life, he would have been bombarded with kunai first and asked questions later. The Mimro was rather confident in his abilities, but he wasn't delusional enough to think that he could take on a village full of ninja by himself, especially with his current ailment. If he indeed decided to stay, he would have to start training the boy immediately. Even now he could feel a cough coming on and the cold breath of the Shinigami on his shoulder. He didn't have long left in this world, his disease would finish him soon. He was slightly bitter with the fact that he would most likely die in a hospital bed and not in battle, but he pushed these thoughts aside as he stepped into the Hokage Tower. As he passed through the doors he felt the eyes of at least half a dozen Anbu on him. It took a great deal of concentration not to look at them, they already suspected him, and if he was to reveal that he could see the hidden Anbu it would be asking for trouble. He walked up to the help desk, pointedly ignoring the looks of bewilderment on the faces of the ninja in the building. It wasn't every day you see someone just waltz into the Hokage Tower, and surely not when they were so obviously from another village. As he reached the Chunin on duty froze in his seat. It was a man of average build, a deep scar marrying the skin of his face from one cheek, across the nose, to the other. The man looked frozen in fear, but it didn't look like he was looking at Kimimro, rather his eyes were locked on the boy. The bone user scowled, he'd had enough taking back seat to this kid, Kami people ignored him, someone that could kill most of them without a sweat, and instead focused on a mostly harmless little boy. There was something different about this man's stare however, he didn't look fearful off boy, but rather, what would happen to the boy as he was in the arms of an unknown ninja. The Mimro cleared his throat, getting the man's attention. Seeing that he finally had the man looking at him, Kamimro spoke. I am here to see the Hokage dot he said, having to break in the middle to stifle a cough. The scarred man's eyes widened, do you have an appointment with Sandame sama he asked, still keeping Naruto within the corner of his vision. The Mimro couldn't stop the next cough, and silently cursed himself as he broke out into a small fit. His illness had been subdued for so long, why did it have to spike up right now? The cough eventually subsided, and he was able to speak again. No, the Chunin shook his head, then I'm afraid you'll have to wait. He was cut off as Kamimro brought out the scroll with a huff of annoyance. The man's eyes bulged out as he saw the Hokage crest. He stuttered as he tried to form a coherent sentence. The Mimro cut him off with a hand, this man was starting to grate on his nerves. What is your name, Trashinobi? The Chunin sputtered a bit more, and just when he was about to give up on the man he got out, Uruka. You mean Uruka? He nodded. 
take this trash from me for a minute dot and before the man could respond he had removed the boy from his shoulders and shoved him into the Chuanin's arms, already heading down the hall towards the Hokage's office, leaving Aruka in his seat with an unconscious Naruto in his hands. Sure, it was not the most effective way to get rid of the boy, but it worked. That Aruka had been the first person since he had entered the village that hadn't looked at the boy with loathing. And besides, Kamimuro had no idea how this meeting with the Sandane would go, and if he had to get away fast, he didn't want anything hampering his escape. Hell, he didn't know if he could escape in the first place, should things get hairy. He let out a sigh as he pushed open the door to Hokage's office, without knocking. Ami-sama help me. Saratobi was stamping papers when the door to his office opened, without so much as a single knock to announce the person's arrival. He frowned and set his rubber stamp down on the corner of his desk. Whoever it was hadn't had the decency to knock, so he figured they could at least wait a minute for him to prepare to address whoever it was. Someone powerful he knew, he could practically see the chakra flow into the room as the person entered, probably Kakashi or Tenzu. The person cleared their throat irritably, and Suratobi had half the mind to send him or her out of the room without a glance, but decided that he may as well get it over with, as he wanted to spend as little time with this impatient person as possible. So he looked up and barely had time to catch his pipe before it fell from between his teeth, a side effect of his drop jaw. Now when he had sent that letter into Orochimaru's fortress, by all accounts he was very skeptical as to whether he would even be acknowledged, let alone responded to. But never, in his wildest dreams would he have expected the person one of Orochimaru's most loyal followers, even to be standing in his office, barely five days later. He managed to compose himself after a few moments and motioned for the white-haired young man to sit down, to which he complied. The man's face was stony, but Saratobi could swear he saw the ghost of a smile of amusement. They spent the first few moments in uncomfortable silence, neither one of them wanting to start off. After a while Saratobi eventually folded and decided that he had better introduce himself. Saratobi Sasuke, Sandame Hokage and leader of Kanahagakurhi, said with a small bow of his head, I appreciate that you have decided to visit he let it hang for a moment. The man looked slightly confused for a moment, before a look of realization came onto his face, and he shifted in his seat. Kagaya Kamimuro Dadi said indifferently. The Sandame gave him a light smile, it is a pleasure to meet you, Kamimuro san it was subtle, but Siratobi raised an eyebrow when he saw Kamimuro stiffen at the title. He shouldn't have been surprised, given the poor boy's background, but it was saddening to see him so uncomfortable with a term of respect. After another moment of silence, Kamimuro finally chose to speak. I received your letter. The wizened Hokage flashed him another polite smile, yes. The Shikatsu Yaku user closed his eyes for a moment and sighed, the action making him suddenly look very frail. I'm too tired to discuss everything right now, but tomorrow, I want to speak to you. You better be able to convince me that trash is really my relative. The Sandame scowled. It was hard for him to hear Naruto spoken of in such a way. But he supposed beggars couldn't be choosers. He would rather have a mentor for the boy than none at all. I assure you that I can Dotty took a puff of his pipe. And if you were wondering he gave Kamimuro a look, his name is Naruto. The Shikatsu Yaku user tilted his head slightly in silent amusement, fish cake. The Sandame sighed, the name was, I think, referring to Maelstrom Dotty said dryly, but knowing his father's obsession with Raymond, the wizen man shook his head. In any case, I can arrange for you to meet him tomorrow. The Mimro let out a quiet scoff, I have met Naruto. Saruto blinked, pardon. Another ghost of a smile appeared on the bone user's face, but it was gone so fast it could have just been Saratobi's imagination. Yes, I met him as I was entering the village. I engaged him and brought him here after he lost consciousness here Kamimuro scowled, his ninja skills are quite pathetic, really. Saratobi sighed once again choosing to ignore the fact that the man had fought one of his ninja, besides, he doubted Naruto was hurt suddenly seeming much older. Yes he has lived a hard life. I could find no one willing to teach him. Kamimuro shot the man with a suspicious look, but waited for him to continue. The villagers, well, they do not see him as what he is. I am sure you saw the looks when you brought him through the village. The Mimro nodded slowly, not sure where this was going. The, the old man paused for a second, before changing his approach, no doubt you have heard of the Kaiubi attack 12 years ago, when our Yandame Hokage risked his life to defeat the fox that is what is told outside of our village, anyway he took a long drag on his pipe, it saddened him to talk about that day, even now. But what you most likely do not know, is that even the Yandame could not defeat the Kaiubi. Yandame couldn't defeat the fox, so he sealed it away. With lesser biju, there have been cases in which the demon is sealed inside something, such as a base or an ornament. But the Kayubi the strongest of the biju, could not have been killed, nor sealed into a simple object. Yandame knew this beforehand, so he prepared. He was a seal master, and with my student he prepared a seal that would lock Kayubi in a human being. He sacrificed himself to the Shinigami, in order to seal the Kayubi into his son. Namely, Naruto. 
The sand dame watched the Kagaya warily as he finished his condensed version of the sealing of the Kaiubi, wondering if he would show the same hate as the villagers did. He was slightly perturbed to find that the man's face held only a look of blank interest. Of course you can't kill a demon muttered the bone user. To think the Kanoha ninja could be so foolish to think that a mere man could kill a monster that could destroy a mountain with a look. But if the demon was truly sealed inside the boy, it could have some effects on his use of the Shikatsun Yaku, which might explain the abnormal maturity of Naruto's bones. It could also explain his healing ability. He silently grinned to himself, this could seriously help the boy. By the time Kimimura was done with him, he'd be able to give even Orochimaru a run for his money. But there was still something that bothered him, you still haven't explained why the villagers hate him so much he said, genuinely confused. Tsuritobi smiled solemnly, but I have he set his pipe on the table. The villagers hate Naruto, because he protects them. He has the Kayubi sealed in him. That confused Kimimuro even more, I don't understand. The Sandame sighed, on that day, many family members were lost, and even more were badly injured. Many of the people in Kanoha hold insatiable hate towards the Kayubi. They don't see Naruto as their protector, but rather as the reincarnation of the Kayubi no Yoko. Kimimuro blanked for a moment, but nodded in understanding. That would explain it, though he questioned the villagers' reasoning, he understood their thoughts. Surely, he harbored great hate towards the Kayubi, simply because it had tainted one of his siblings, thought not necessarily in a bad way, and was probably the reason for his mother's death, but he was not delusional enough to hate someone, because they held the burden of carrying it. Mother. He inhaled deeply. He didn't even know how she died. Though, he doubted he wanted to know and kept his inquiries to himself. Pushing his thoughts away he said, I think I will take my leave Hokage-san. The age-wise and Hokage nodded and dug around in his desk for a moment, before tossing the bone user a silver metal pendant with a symbol of the leaf embedded in its surface. Show that to anyone that questions you, it's a medal that most Anbu carry around, it signifies that you have my trust the man gave him a strange look for a moment, where will you stay? I have sufficient Ryo, I will search for an inn where I can stay. Kimimura responded. I can find an empty house for you, he shook his head, it isn't required. Tsuritobi nodded slowly, respecting the boy's wishes. Alright he said, you may meet me tomorrow after you find some place to stay, and if you decide to teach him you'll have free reign. But remember this, I will be watching, and I will not allow anything else to befall Naruto. He finished dangerously. Kimimuro nodded his understanding and walked out the door, the lock clicking behind him. The sand dame sighed to himself and massaged his temples. Naruto, I hope you are prepared I have a feeling that this won't be easy on you. Kimimuro had decided that the village of the leaf was going to take some serious getting used to. It had been quite a while since he had experienced the flow of a village. In fact, he had never experienced the bustling flow and feel of a place quite like Kanoha. Not that this was a huge surprise, most of his young life had been spent in a cell, hidden away in fear by the very man responsible for his existence. The lively attitude of this damned city was already giving him a headache, the last thing he needed was more stress on his cranium. The sun had barely peeked over the horizon, and already dozens of people were roaming the streets, preparing their shops for the day or shouting words of encouragement to the few ninja that were strolling along. Birds were chirping, and the aroma of eggs and bacon wafted up to Kamimro's nostrils as he leaped from the rooftops. The whole scene was rather revolting. He quickened his pace to avoid soaking in any more of the early morning's festivities. He was on his way to pick up the boy, Naruto, that was his name. Kimimura was going to have to work on that if he was going to be spending time with the child for a while. Not that he had made any particular judgment as to his future plans at the moment. The trash was still trash for now, the boy had proved nothing. Near the street he was told that Chunin, Haruka, lived. Apparently that was the ninja that he had handed the boy off to yesterday. He located the apartment building with the right address and stopped in front of it. Kimimura took a deep breath and rubbed his temples. He really did have a headache. He doubted the boy would be happy to see him, and most likely the ensuing confrontation would aggravate his migraine even more. With a resolute sigh he shook his head and went for the door. Naruto awoke to the smell of coffee. A hetet cafe. It was a bitter, nasty concoction that was better left to the old geezers that were always sipping on it to keep their wrinkle-beaten brows open. Even for them, Naruto couldn't see why they would want such a disgusting drink. It probably just burned the rest of their age-worn taste buds off. He grumbled and rolled over. Why was he smelling coffee in his house anyway? But the start, Naruto opened his eyes for the first time. He was staring at the back of the couch. Not his couch. His couch had torn satin cushions, this one had new leather. And there were no springs sticking out. Realizing that he definitely was not at home, he sprung to his feet. Or at least tried to. A sudden burst of pain hit him in his ribcage, and he toppled to the ground onto a thick carpet. Kami, he felt like he'd been stabbed by a katana. He looked down at himself to discover that he was not wearing his orange jumpsuit, it had been replaced by simple pajama pants. 
Shinobi rap covered his ribs, and with a couple painful pokes and jabs at himself, Naruto decided they weren't too bad, just very tender. He sat up on the floor still very perplexed at his situation. The last thing he remembered was that nonsense from the forest. That was it. The shinobi that had the same markings that he had, he remembered now from the woods. He must have been knocked out and that's when he was brought here. Naruto glanced around, wherever he was. He was in a pretty bare room. He had been sleeping on a couch that was pretty much the only furniture in the place. There was a small television facing the couch that didn't look like it was used very much, and a small coffee table with a lamp sitting in the corner. There was a door on the far side of the room, and beside it, Naruto spotted his orange jumpsuit. What the hell, he stumbled over and decided to slip his gear back on. He suited back up and discovered that nothing was missing from the pockets. It even smelled like someone had washed it. He found his shinobi bandana laying underneath and put that on as well, still not coming to grips with the sudden changes in his appearance. Speaking of which, he scowled as he recalled the similarities the man from the forest had with his own altered self. The white hair, the fiery red dots, maybe it was some rare disease that he had never heard of. That wouldn't be that shocking, he normally dozed off during those lessons at the academy. Thinking of the man made Naruto wonder what had become of the nonsense anyway. He couldn't think of any way he could have gotten bandaged unless someone from the village had found him. Unless he was taken somewhere else that particular fear struck Naruto hard, but a quick look out the window to the familiar streets of Konoha quickly struck down that thought. He let out a brief sigh of relief, but it didn't take long for him to wonder again just where the hell he was. He looked again to the door and with sudden resolve decided that he was going to find out. He swung open the door and found himself staring down a short hallway. The smell of coffee was stronger out there, and Naruto stepped quietly down to a door at the end of the hallway that he hoped was the exit. He couldn't hear much, but straining he made out hushed voices on the other side of the door. Not stopping to try to make out what the voices were saying he swung open the door and stepped into the room. At first the change in lighting disoriented him, but through the spots he saw a familiar figure sitting in a far rocking chair, sipping a large mug of coffee. Aruka sensei Ah, Naruto Aruka startled from his seat, spilling some of his steaming hot drink onto his leg. He didn't seem to notice, you're awake already. Something was wrong, Aruka was acting weird. Yeah Naruto attempted to shield his eyes from the bright overhead lights, what the hell is going on here anyway. He trailed off as his eyes adjusted, and he saw just who was sitting in the adjourning sofa. Cold gray eyes, as hard as steel met his gaze. A shiver ran down his spine, just like the time in the forest barely a day ago. Shit Naruto came to his senses and without thinking hurled a kunai at the opposing ninja. The man simply leaned his head to the side as the knife whizzed by his ear, impaling itself in the wall behind the sofa. Forgetting his injuries for the moment, Naruto yanked out another kunai and prepared to launch across the room. Naruto no. Naruka's cry fell upon deaf ears and Naruto charged. All that was on his mind was the night before. That wicked grin that had looked down upon him as he had laid upon the forest floor was fresh in his conscious. Naruto tightened his grip on the kunai had pushed forward with all of his might, aiming the point between the other shinobi's eyes, before he was suddenly jolted. His whole arm went numb as all of his momentum suddenly came to a stop. The man had a crushing grip on his wrist that forced Naruto to a knee. The kunai was stopped just as it had penetrated the skin, and a slow stream of blood dropped down the man's forehead. Juan Naruto's breath hitched in his throat. Let go of me. Naruto pulled back as hard as he could, dropping the bloody kunai to the floor. The shinobi held his wrist for a moment longer before scoffing. Crash. Naruto suddenly was released, and the absence of resistance landed him on his rear end. The long pregnant silence passed as the two locked gazes. Naruto's own bright blue eyes seemed to be swallowed up by the cold gray pits of the other man's eyes. Haruka watched the scene silently from the couch. He was attempting to look neutral, but his tense posture gave away his anxiety. It took Naruto a good minute to steady his breathing, but he doubted his heart would stop pounding for a long while. Who who are you? His whispered question drew no response from the shinobi. His hard gaze did not falter in the slightest. Naruto Aruka interjected. He looked hesitant to speak up, and his voice was hushed, so as to not disturb the silence of the room. Why don't you sit down on the couch? There's a lot to explain. No Naruto replied quickly, tell me what the hell is going on. His gaze shifted back to the silent shinobi on the couch. He hadn't bothered to wipe away the blood. It was dripping on the couch, leaving a dark stain on the cushion. The man still did not respond. Naruto's fear was starting to wear away. He wanted to know why this man was sitting there. He wanted to know why Aruka was giving him that strange look. He was tired of being kept in the dark. He was going to find out why this nonsense was sitting in his sensei's living room, and why some ninja from the village hadn't taken care of him yet. Talk, damn it. A small smirk. Who the hell are you? The man stood then, towering over Naruto. He took the sleeve of his medical kimono and wiped his face, smearing blood across the fabric. He gave Naruto another heart-piercing stare. My name is Kagaya Kimimro. he leaned in close. 
Some blood was still smeared on his cheek. And I am here to show you how to be a ninja. So, what the hell do you want me to do again? I want to see your power, trash. It's not that difficult of a request. Naruto frowned. He was currently standing in the middle of training ground 13, facing the man he had come to know as Kamimro. The ex-sound nin had not told him much about himself, only that he was going to train Naruto with his new abilities, which apparently Kamimro possessed as well. Naruto was reluctant to trust the man that had tried to kill him less than a day ago, but Aruka had told him that the idea had already been cleared by the Hokage. And hell, if Ajison was okay with it, he doubted that he would be in danger. But still, the man standing before him was rough around the edges. Must I repeat myself again Kamimro asked irritably, show me the bone blade that almost killed your sensei. I Naruto hesitated at the mention of the incident. It was still a sore spot for him. He hadn't known what to think about himself after he had sprouted a bone from his arm. He had no idea whether it was the Kaiubi's doing or some strange injury he had somehow inflicted on himself. Now just finding out he had an ability that no one else in Kanoha possessed was a little hard to comprehend. I'm not sure how to do it he admitted, scratching the back of his head embarrassedly. This elicited a sigh from Kamimro. Which led to a small coughing fit. When he had recovered he wiped his mouth and said, the Shikatsumyaku is activated by emotion. Remember what exactly you were feeling during the first activation you should be able to replicate the experience. Naruto frowned uncertainty. I'm okay. Just do it. Tentatively, Naruto held out his right arm, attempting to remember that day. The way his sudden transformations had put him on edge. The way Kakashi's smug attitude had gotten under his skin. The way he felt inadequate after failing to catch the, soon his thoughts had moved on from just that incident to general wrongdoings that had been done to him throughout his life. His constant rejections from Sakura. Sasuke's constant condensation. Remembering these had sparked something in Naruto. He felt the anger start to well up inside of him, and a pressure started to build on his chest. Naruto Baka, leave Sasu come alone. Leave me alone Naruto. HN, dope. Naruto was no longer in the training field. He found himself in the dark of his consciousness, surrounded by his painful memories. He gripped his head as more and more memories poured in. One particular memory pulled the last straw as anger gave way to rage. Looks like you won't be Hokage after all. Suddenly Naruto's arm flared with pain. He ignored the ache, too caught up in his rollercoaster of emotion. The ache eventually rose to a sharp pain. Finally, it reached an unbearable amount of pain, just like before. The pain forced his mind back to the training ground. Ah. He clutched his right forearm and fell to a knee as the pressure increased even more. Bile rose in his throat as he experienced the deja vu of his ulna bone, pushing its way out of his arm. He doubled over as the skin above his wrist split, exposing the bone as it slid smoothly out of his forearm, until it extended a good two and a half feet past his fingertips. Blood gushed from where the bone protruded and spilled onto the grass. Naruto could no longer hold the contents of his stomach. After emptying his gut, Naruto wiped his mouth and let out a long breath. The pain had subsided back to a minor soreness in his arm. He turned to find Kamimura watching the scene in silence from a few feet away. Naruto rose shakily to his feet and faced the x sound ninja. Is this what you wanted he raised his arm, the milky white of the bone contrasted the blood that covered his forearm. Kamimro simply coughed and stepped forward. He grabbed Naruto a bit roughly by the arm to inspect the bone blade. Naruto winced at the tenderness in his arm but didn't object. The white-haired shinobi ran his hand up the flat of the bone. It was flawless, the pearly white surface was as smooth as any metal. Naruto watched as he also skimmed a finger along the front tapered edge of the bone, seemingly not noticing as it sliced his finger. Kamimro suddenly released Naruto's arm. It seems that your stimulating emotion is anger. He noted. Naruto nodded quietly. Your Shikatsumyaku is unlike a traditional Kagai as Kamimro stated. His voice seemed to hold an undertone of curiosity. Pain is a natural part of the process, but most first-time users don't produce bones this large. Kagaya. Kamimro scoffed, yes Kagaya. You best remember the name boy, for it is the very name for the blood that runs through your veins. The blood that produces the Shikatsumyaku, most powerful of all Keke Genkai. Naruto blinked and was silent for a moment. The blood that ran through his veins. He looked at the bone extending from his arm and wondered whether that was a blessing or a curse. This is the Shikatsumyaku. Kamimro coughed violently but nodded, yes. Will it always hurt this bad Naruto asked, remembering how painful it was to extract the blade. The first time he had passed out and nearly the second time too. He couldn't really see how the technique would be useful if he was too busy crying from the pain. Pain is not a sensory function that a true shinobi should possess. Kamimura remarked, the Shikatsumyaku is the ultimate technique. The pain it inflicts on the user is trivial when compared to the pain inflicted on its opponent. Naruto tried to not let his skepticism show on his face. This idiot sure was pretentious. He would probably be better served blowing his nose than talking up his ability so much. To tell the truth though, Naruto didn't know what to think about having such a skill. 
his general opinion on blood limit abilities was negative, basing it on his experiences with the Sharingan and the Hyugas by Akigan. Thinking about it though, he had more of a problem with the arrogant way the nonsenses held themselves than the power they had. Naruto didn't care how powerful they were, they didn't have the right to look down upon everyone like they did. Now though, he found himself standing before someone who was much the same way. From the little he knew of Kamimuro, the man was a psychopath. He had brutally attacked Naruto in the forest something he wasn't soon to forget and seemed to be the most stoic person Naruto had met since Shino, his classmate. The only true emotion Naruto had seen from the man was disdain. Trash, yup, disdain. Stop calling me that Naruto growled, clenching his fist. I'll stop calling you that when you prove to me that you are worthy of being considered something more than garbage Kamimura replied coldly, and maybe if you spent less time daydreaming, I wouldn't have to get your attention. Naruto grunted and was about to cross his arms, but realized his bone sword got in the way. He really was not liking this guy. As I was saying Kamimura paused to cough, I have decided to teach you for the time being. That is only if you can agree to a couple of regulations. He waited until Naruto nodded before continuing, if I am to train you with the Shikatsun Yaku, you must be completely committed. You will train for as long and as hard as I see fit. I will train you to be a true shinobi, if you desire. I can guarantee that you will become powerful. You will learn to ignore pain, and you will learn how to do what is necessary. This is the way of the Kagaya. Naruto soaked all this in as Kamimura paused. He wasn't sure. He wanted to become Hokage, didn't that require him to be the strongest? He looked at the battle-hardened man in front of him and realized he looked even younger than some of the Chunin Naruto had seen around Konoha, certainly younger than Iruka. Yet Naruto knew he could kill most of the ninja he had ever seen. He might even be able to take Kakashi Sensei. Do you accept? Naruto took one look at his would-be Sensei and glanced once more at his protruding bone blade before he made his decision. He nodded. You will have the rest of the day for yourself Kamimuro said, waving his hand. He stepped forward suddenly and placed his hand on Naruto's forearm, the tender area where the bone had come out. His hand glowed green for an instant before his other hand grabbed the makeshift bone blade and yanked it free of Naruto's arm. Surprisingly, Naruto felt no pain, but couldn't help but let out breath as Kamimuro pulled the bone free. Eventually you will learn to merge the bones back into your skeleton Kamimuro said, weighing the newly acquired bone in his hand, testing the weight. For now, I'll simply extract them. It will give me a chance to see how your skeletal structure regenerates as well. Naruto just blinked, speechless. Egg and trash Kamimura waved his hand, I shall see you here tomorrow after you meet with your team. He turned and inspected Naruto for another moment before continuing, and if you do not have a suitable change of clothes by that point, I'll show you just how devastating the Shikatsunyaku can be. Clothes? What the hell? Naruto didn't think that what he wore had anything to do with his ability as a ninja. What was wrong with his jumpsuit anyway? He glanced down at his attire to prove his mental statement. Well he had to admit that they were kind of beat up, his recent delving into the horror that was D-ranked missions had taken its toll on his outfit. Various rips and stains adorned his once bright and lively orange jumpsuit. Hell, one of the legs was almost disconnected at the knee. Naruto somehow doubted that any amount of stitching could restore his clothing to its prior glory. Damn, that meant he had to find some new clothes. As he strolled down the streets of Konoha Naruto glanced around for a clothing store that he might be permitted to purchase from. Or at least one where he hadn't been kicked out of before. However, he frowned when he realized that most of the stores were already closing down. With a start he found that the sun was already retreating down the horizon. The day really had gotten away from him. Naruto came to a stop at the last store in sight that was open. It was a rather dingy looking place, the outside was in dire need of being repainted and shingles were coming off of the roof. But the inside looked clean and inviting, and a gentle-looking lady with graying blonde hair was sitting behind the counter. Naruto hesitantly walked through the door, and his ears were meant with a pleasant dinging sound, which brought the attention of the old lady. Oh she started. Naruto tensed as she looked him over. Well, if it's not a customer. We are close to closing, so what can I help you with? Um I just needed to get some new clothes Naruto stuttered. He wasn't quite sure what to think about the woman, but she seemed nice enough. For ninja wear. Um, I can see that dot the woman gave him a teasing smile before snapping her fingers and pointing towards the back of the store. My granddaughter is in the back if you were looking for help. She's quite superficial, I'm sure she'll set you up with something stylish. Oh okay Naruto hurried as the lady ushered him back. He found a rather large section of the store that was devoted to shinobi garb. The store was a lot bigger than it appeared on the outside. Uncertainly, he started looking through the aisles for a suitable outfit. He grunted in frustration as he realized he had no idea where to start. He had never been shopping before, and the way he had been so easily invited in had unnerved him a bit. He wasn't used to hospitality. Naruto was looking through a couple of ninja pants when a familiar voice startled him. Naruto. He jumped and spun around quickly. 
his blue eyes met green, and a mop of blonde hair flooded his vision. Ino chan. The girl was right in his face, giving him a curious glance. Naruto took an uncomfortable step back, what are you doing here? Ino gave him a blank look, um, I was helping my botch and close up her store. She looked him up and down, why are you here? Ha! Ah, well Naruto scratched the back of his head nervously, I kinda needed to get some new clothes, you know. Mine are pretty trashed. Ino scoffed at him, that's probably the biggest understatement I've heard in a while Naruto. I wouldn't even call those rags clothes. Naruto flinched a bit at that, he wasn't sure why. For some reason, recently he had become more sensitive to his classmates' scrutiny. He wouldn't say that their words hurt him, but he was so tired of being treated like an outcast. His recent interactions with Sakura could probably be to blame for that. They're the best I could find Dadi replied quietly, looking away. Though Ino hesitated for a moment, and Naruto spotted some emotion flash in her eyes before it suddenly vanished. Don't worry about it. I'll find you something cool, guaranteed. Who better to give you advice on style than me, right she flashed him a bright smile. Naruto blinked. Where had that come from? Ino had never been as mean to him in the academy as his other classmates, but he wouldn't go as far to say that she was Naseto him. He wasn't sure what to do with her smiling at him like that. He eventually smiled back hesitantly. Yeah, you're probably the best person to ask. I know. Now come on Ino pulled him around a corner to an aisle that he hadn't yet explored. This is where I put all the best stuff. Now, what color? Hmm, black for sure, you're a ninja after all, but we can throw in some nice complimenting colors too, I suppose you want orange. Naruto stood by awkwardly as Ino sorted through a myriad of clothes that she thought would best suit him. She looked for a good 20 minutes, occasionally holding a piece of material up to see how it looked next to Naruto, before she finally decided on an outfit. She quickly ushered him into a dressing room and demanded he put the stuff on. Naruto still wasn't quite sure what to think, but he obeyed. Stumbling into the dressing room he found himself face to face with a mirror. He gave himself one long look in the mirror. Then he sighed and began to put the clothes on. Yamanaka Ino stood outside the door of the dressing room, biting her nail. The last person she ever expected to see in her grandmother's shop was Naruto. Truth be told, she hadn't been all that thrilled to see him either. Naruto had always been a bit of an annoyance to Ino. Sure, she didn't have to deal with the constant attention he gave Sakura, but she got a healthy dose of his fawning as well. She had admittedly been a bit meaner than she maybe should have been in the past, but it was so hard not to get frustrated with someone like Naruto. Ino had never seen Naruto sad. He was always smiling, perhaps that was the part that she found so annoying. How could someone just be that happy? She had never understood how he was able to laugh off all of the rejections he received from Sakura or all of the terrible comments he was subject to by his other classmates. The boy seemed to have an indomitable spirit that just couldn't be dampened. But when Ino had made a comment about the conditions of his clothes he had suddenly become so vulnerable. Ino hesitated to use such a word with Naruto. Naruto the self-proclaimed ultimate prankster. Naruto who never failed to make even the most terrible of situations worth a laugh. In fact, thinking back on it, that was what Naruto had always been. Someone that made people feel better about themselves. A person that anyone could make fun of to hide their own insecurities. Ino glanced at the door. She wasn't sure what had spurred her sudden thoughts about Naruto, but it had to be the fact that it was the first time she had spotted genuine sadness behind his blue veils. She had decided that she would be as nice to him as she could handle. She would try. Just because he had always been so nice to her. She was brought out of her thoughts as she heard the lock on the door click. Naruto came slowly out of the dressing room, as if he hadn't grown accustomed to moving in his new clothes. Wow wow, Ino's surprise made itself vocal as she took in Naruto's new appearance. It was just so different. She had fitted Naruto with a pair of black shinobi pants that billowed out around his knees, before tightening above his ankles with an elastic band. An orange sash was tied around his waist, the loose ends hanging down to about his mid-thigh. His feet were covered in long black socks and slipped into a fresh pair of black ninja sandals. He was wearing a black shirt that had one sleeve that extended down his left arm, leaving his kunai-throwing arm free of resistance. Over that was a black shinobi vest with utility pockets all around for practicability. Covering his hands were standard fingerless ninja gloves with a protective metal backing. Um, does it look bad or something Naruto asked, shifting under her gaze. Though Ino shook her head, no, it looks good. I just can't believe I'm seeing you and not everything is orange. She studied him a bit more before nodding. Yup, I think that'll work don't you then she noticed something. Hey, what's with the bandana, Naruto? That has to go. Uh, no I think. Naruto's complaints were cut off as Ino ripped the bandana off of his head, freeing his mop of hair. Huh? Ino blinked as she noticed that Naruto's usually sunshine blonde hair was a lot lighter. In fact, his spiky locks were lighter than her own. It was almost white. Naruto, did you dye your hair or something she asked, puzzled. Naruto sputtered for a moment, confusing Ino further, before he replied, uh, yeah I did. 
what do you think? Ino got the feeling that he was keeping something to himself, but decided to leave it alone. It looks kinda cool she observed. You really shouldn't keep it hidden away. I'll get you a hi eight. hold on. Ino quickly retrieved a hi eight with extended tie strings. She had Naruto put it on and nodded approvingly at how it hung down his neck and held up his wild hair. There, I think that's it she exclaimed, giving Naruto a smile. Heh, thanks Ino-chan. Naruto gave her one of his own signature grins and laughed a little bit. Ino's own smile widened a bit at how cheerful he suddenly seemed. The two stood there in silence for a couple of moments before an aged voice called back from the front of the store. Ino. It's time to close up. Did you find what that boy was looking for? Boy, it's already late. Sorry Ino-chan, here's some money. See you later. Before Ino could respond, Naruto shoved a wad of cash in her hand and dashed out of the store, giving her a wave as he left. He left Ino standing there stupidly, her mouth still open to say her own goodbye. Bye Naruto. She trailed off, he was already gone. She glanced down at the roll of Ryo he had left her. Bam, just how much money did he give me? What the hell does that mean? Kimimuro groaned as Naruto shouted his complaints once again. It was the next day and Kimimuro was planning to start teaching the boy, but it seemed like a lost cause. And damn, the trash sure was loud. He honestly couldn't understand how someone related to himself could turn out to be so damn annoying. It was currently around 6 in the afternoon, and Kimimuro had been trying to show and explain to Naruto the basics of the Shikatsunyaku for the last three hours. The boy just wasn't getting it though, no matter how simple Kimimuro tried to make it. Not that this was completely unconceivable, the Kagaya bloodline was a complicated technique, even Kimimuro did not know everything about it. At least he wasn't forced to look at that horrendous orange jumpsuit any longer, still, the trash's incompetence was infuriating. Boy, nonsense are you even listening? Shut. Up. Kimimuro ground out. We'll move on, your tiny brain obviously cannot comprehend the complications of the Shikatsumyaku. Hey. Kimimuro ignored him and continued, what do you know about chakra control? Naruto stopped complaining and blinked, well, I know I have to use chakra for, right? So I have to control it to do his face scrunched up as he thought, but I dunno what that has to do with anything. Ghoul Kimimuro scoffed, chakra control is much more than just channeling energy for dot you can't just pump energy into a without control, or you'll waste all of your energy. Huh Naruto scratched his head, I remember Iruka sensei saying something like that. He always said that I wasn't good at the whole control thing though. Obviously, if you can't give me a half-decent explanation on chakra, you probably won't be to control it at all. Kimimuro sighed and shook his head. Trash the fundamentals of the Shikatsunyaku is based upon the complete control of one's chakra. It's necessary for the manipulation of your skeleton and the formation of your bone blades. If you can't control your chakra then that is why you can't control the activation of your Shikatsunyaku. It took a moment for Naruto to take all of this in. After a while he replied, so if I can find a way to control my chakra, then I can take out that bone thing, Shikatsumyaku, Naruto waved his hand dismissively, fine. So I'll be able to draw out my Shikatsumyaku at any time though, right? Kimimuro coughed into his hand and cleared his throat. Yes. The ex sound nin noticed Naruto looking down at his hand. He clenched it into a fist and stared for a while longer before he said anything, do I really want this Shikatsumyaku thing? Isn't it like cheating? To use something like this to get stronger. The Mimro was in Naruto's face before the boy could react. He focused his steely gaze on the genin with anger. Cheating. There is no cheating in the shinobi world, boy. Realize that anything you can do to become stronger is what will keep you alive when the people around you are dropping dead. What you possess is not simply an ordinary keke dot. The Mimro backed away before he continued, but kept Naruto frozen with his stare. What you possess is a blessing or a curse. The Shikatsumyaku is not like other blood limits in that not every user that has it will be able to simply control it. If you are strong enough to conquer it, you will see, it is not a simple skill to learn. If you are weak like so many other trash ninja, well, you'll end up killing yourself or someone else. The Mimro finished and watched Naruto contemplate what he had said in silence. The boy was scowling, and he could tell that Naruto was struggling with a decision. Heh, Kimimuro didn't understand the difficulty, it was either becoming stronger or not, but he decided to remain silent. Just when Kimimuro thought he'd never speak, Naruto stood. Fine, I'll do whatever it takes to become stronger. I can't become Hokage otherwise. I have to be the strongest to be able to protect everybody. His eyes met Kimimuro's, and the ex-sound nin couldn't help but notice the cold resolve in those blue orbs, so how do I learn to control my chakra? Kimimuro grinned slightly, I believe there is an exercise that you might rather enjoy. Naruto swallowed, what's it called? Tree walking. By tree walking, Kimimuro must have meant hell. Naruto cursed as his legs gave out, and he collapsed in front of a particularly large oak tree. Said tree had several imprinted footmarks in it. Naruto had trouble repressing his chakra enough to keep from puncturing the tree's surface. 
Hell, he had completely destroyed the first tree he tried to climb. As he lay there, trying to work the fire out of his exhausted legs, he looked up at the oak. He'd only been able to get halfway up the tree before falling so far, and he had been at it for hours. Kamimro had left long ago, leaving Naruto to his practice. Sadistic nonsense. Naruto could hardly move, he was so drained. His legs were jelly underneath him, and his arms felt like they weighed a thousand pounds. Idly, he wondered if unlocking his had made him heavier. His drowsy mind marked it off as a discussion for another time. The grass had suddenly gotten so soft underneath his head. If you are weak like so many other trash ninja, well, you'll end up killing yourself or someone else. Kamimro's cold words from earlier washed through Naruto's consciousness with about as much subtlety as a tidal wave. Soon he was sitting up, looking miserably at the large oak. He couldn't quit now. He groaned and forced himself to stumble to his feet. Kamimro, the nonsense might not be Naruto's most favorite person in the world, but he was right. If Naruto didn't get stronger, he would never be able to control the damn Shikatsu Yaku. He could even hurt someone he cared about. The Hokage's sole duty was to protect the people of his village, so Naruto couldn't have that happen. He snatched a kunai out of his pocket to mark his spot on the tree and took a deep breath. He formed the ram sign with his hands and reached for his chakra, directing the life energy down to his feet. With a grunt, he charged the tree. He would show the idiot just who he was calling trash. The Mimro jumped as a kunai implanted itself in the dirt next to him. Naruto grinned widely, patting himself on the back for his marksmanship. Hey idiot he called down from his perch. I've got this tree walking stuff down. It had been two days since Naruto had first attempted the tree walking exercise. He had been at it ever since, the only real intermissions he had taken were occasional meetings with Team 7 where he was subject to more horror, D-ranked missions and of course, Raymond breaks. Yesterday Kamimro had stopped by for a couple hours to observe him silently. The white-haired ninja hadn't said a word to Naruto the entire time, but he heard the man muttering to himself occasionally. Mostly it was when Naruto would blow off a piece of the tree by channeling too much chakra to his feet. Needless to say, Kamimura wasn't much help. The day he had gotten to the top for the first time. That was an hour ago. Now this was his third time up the tree, and he had barely jogged. That was mighty impressive, he thought. Naruto was brought out of his musings as a kunai whizzed by his face, leaving a shallow cut in his cheek. He jumped in surprise and looked back down to the base of the tree to see Kamimura fuming. He realized that it had been his own kunai that the ex sound shinobi had tossed at him. It would not be wise for you to try something like that again Kamimro shouted up at him. Naruto grinned and leaped from his perch, descending branch to branch down from the tree. He landed and dusted himself off in front of his instructor. You need to loosen up he said dryly. Kamimro responded with a grunt before coughing into his hand. Naruto shook his head. Kamimro really did not have a sense of humor. Then again, Naruto had surprised himself by even joking with the man. He had, after all, beaten the shit out of him in the forest. Despite that though, the man was teaching Naruto, one-on-one -on -one instruction was not something Naruto had ever gotten before. Hell, just a tree walking exercise was more useful than anything he had ever been taught by someone else before. And he was excited to learn more. So what do I do now Naruto asked, rocking back and forth on his heels, and trying not to seem too anxious. The Mimro coughed, your tree walking is mediocre he stated, you can work on that later though. Your chakra control is still awful, but you should at least be able to draw out a Kakatsu Hyjin. Um huh. The shinobi sighed, it's the name for pulling a bone out of your arm with Shikatsu Yaku. Just try to draw out the Kakatsu, trash. Naruto ignored the annoying name for now, so just like before he asked. The Mimro shook his head, no, what do you think I taught you about tree walking? Now focus your chakra and your arm like you would if you are about to climb a tree. Then push it outward. The quicker you do it, the less it will hurt. At that Naruto hesitated remembering the pain last time he had drawn out the Shikatsu Yaku. He shook his head free of those thoughts as quickly as he could, it wouldn't do any good to think about it. He would just deal with the pain, it was necessary to get stronger. Okay he let out a breath and focused, here goes nothing. Naruto fell down into his chakra reserves, focusing on how the energy flowed through his body, collecting it, and then directing that which he could towards the ulna bone in his right arm. He wasn't quite sure how much chakra he should use, but he settled on the lesser side. He wouldn't want the bone to fire completely out of his arm like it did against Kakashi. Once he decided he had enough, he straightened out his arm so that he wouldn't stab himself. Alright, he thought, and released the chakra, letting it flow outward like Kamimro had told him. Instantly his whole arm tensed up. He grit his teeth as fire raced through his forearm. The muscles clenched and unclenched against his will, convulsing as a large mass, slowly pushed its way out from between the sinew and tendons. Naruto couldn't help but let out a breath as the bone broke the skin with a sickening squelch. Once it had breached the surface it slid out much faster, and within a moment it had reached a full two and a half feet. Naruto stopped releasing the chakra and took a couple deep heaving breaths. Damn that hurt. 
it was a lot smoother than the last time though. And it might just be him, but the pain didn't cripple him this time. What do you think Naruto gasped. Do slow Kamimura observed. If it takes you that long in a battle some trash ninja will run you through before you realize, it thought the white-haired shinobi took a glance at Naruto's arm. The kakatsu itself appears strong and sharp though. Naruto blinked at the last compliment. He was so surprised he completely forgot about the fact that Kamimuro had insulted him in almost the same sentence. Um, thanks. Naruto scratched his head. His reply was a cough. Deciding to move on, Naruto raised his kakatsu hygiene. So how the hell do I get rid of this anyway? Do I keep pulling them out? Isn't that like, I dunno, bad for me? Kamimuro shook his head. The Shikatsunyaku is self-regenerating the bone user slapped his palm on his forehead when he saw the blank look on Naruto's face. It means that the bones in your body come back naturally. Realization struck Naruto's face, oh, so no matter how many bones I pull out I can keep getting more. Cool. Well, no. But yes. Kamimuro sighed, just don't worry about that for now. Hind. Naruto swung his kakatsu around experimentally, this seems really light for being a bone and all. Kamimuro nodded, yes, certain bones are lighter and sharper than others, designed for offense. He gestured at Naruto's arm. That is the ulna bone, the main structural bone in your forearm. It is the primary weapon the Shikatsunyaku uses. Other bones though, are much heavier and stronger. Hmm, interesting Naruto drawled, not really paying attention. He was more focused on inspecting the edge of his ulna, when a sudden thought came to him. Hey, since I'm using something that looks like a sword, I need to learn Kenjutsu right. Yes. When do I do that? The Mimro seemed to think about it for a minute. Then suddenly there was a wet sound as a three-foot-long kakatsu slid out from his left elbow. He ripped the bone out with his right hand and twirled it a couple of times. Naruto swallowed. 